Um, as you can see that we are um, back in the chamber and we do have um, some council members attending via Zoom as well. I'd like to welcome members of the public gallery back. Um, we hope we won't have any technical hitches along the way, but if we do, please do bear with us. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, in terms of apologies, members on leave of absence, I understand we don't have any apologies, but Councillor Loden is running a little bit late, but will be joining us. Um, so we will go straight to public question time and receiving of public statements. So welcome back. It's nice to see you here. If you'd like to make a statement, please come forward to the microphone. Okay, we on? Cool. Ken Wibley, Ecologic Homes. I'm here to speak to item 5.2. Mayor Sorry, Ken, Ken, just before you go on, could you just state the suburb in which you reside? Sorry, I, I reside have a in Rockingham. Reminder. Many thanks. Big drive up here to see you this evening. Mayor Cole, councillors, thank you for the opportunity to speak again tonight. When this project was deferred by council in the March meeting, it was clear that the concern was that the rear units were still considered to be multiple dwellings. We proceeded to revise the plans, liaise with council and reach an access acceptable revised design within three weeks of that council meeting. Now, three months later, and without any further consultation with us, it comes as somewhat of a surprise to find that there are three new reasons for refusal that appeared that have been added to the report. I stress that other than the changes that we have made to the rear units, these plans are the same and they have not changed. So these three new points, firstly, there is a concern about the impact of car bay two on the adjacent unit one. It was our intention to assign this car bay to unit one. We propose to add a new sliding door to give direct access from this bay into the unit. However, if this is a major concern, we will happily not install the door. Now for the big guns. So in addition to complying with council's built form policy, manual and the new R codes for apartments, these two new points refer to non-compliance with the planning and development regulations 2015. Did not the built form manual and R codes provide sufficient scope for assessment of this proposal? We can only conclude that these new reasons for refusal were designed purely to add a bit more fat and weight to the recommendations. This proposal is for residential use the buildings are two storey and the setbacks comply with and are even greater than those required in both the built form policy and the R codes. So we do not see why it is still considered not compatible with the bulk scale and appearance of the area. The car parking in front of the setback was already raised in point one of the, the items of the rules, reasons for refusal. And we previously addressed this issue in our submission to the March round of council meetings. I challenge anyone to visit the site and we are quite happy to meet councillors on site to demonstrate that this car parking is not out of character with the existing car dominated streetscape in the area. The remaining other two reasons for refusal being the screening of the open space to unit six and seven and the storage areas to unit five and eight were carried forward from the report from the March round of meetings of which we addressed in our submission at that time. We have previously recognised that this proposed development does not tick all the boxes of the present day standards. It would be unreasonable to expect that to renovate a 50 year old building and achieve all these standards, just as it would be unreasonable to expect to repair a vintage car to completely comply with present day safety and emission standards. So we ask you councillors to exercise some common sense in this matter and to recognise that although not perfect, this proposal does dramatically improve the amenity of the site for the existing and potential new residents, for the streetscape and for the neighbourhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Next speaker, please. Um. Good evening, Andrew Main of uh, 11 Alfonso Street, North Perth, and I want to speak on the item on the long-term 
cycle network. I don't have the um, item number. Um, could I first <laughs> reverb? The okay. Just checking whether someone no, it's has all right. a phone. Maybe if I keep talking, you won't have. Yep. So just bear okay. with us, Andrew. Sorry. Okay. All right. First of all, I just wanted to thank. All right. Uh. <laughs> How are we going? Right. Testing, testing. Is that working now? Yes. Okay. I think we're okay, Andrew. Yeah, Go all ahead. Right. right. Restart your clocks. Um, First of all, just wanted to say thank you to the uh, staff in the city who have been attending to various requests I've been putting in uh, lately through the Snap Send Sol app, which I've found has worked very well. Um, previously, I've used the uh, email, um, the generic Town of Vincent email to submit issues, or I've used the report it function, but I've found that Snap Send Sol works the best actually in terms of getting response, particularly um, overgrown vegetation over footpaths and so on. So thank you for that. Um, I want, yeah, so in terms of the long-term uh, cycle network item, um, I think it was my concern, I suppose, I've got a concern that it was unfortunate that uh, the community and residents weren't engaged in the process um, in developing this plan. I know the Department of Transport have developed the plan, but um, there's been liaison and negotiation between the city and um, and the department. So um, it would have been um, helpful, I think, for residents to be involved in that somehow. Um, per, uh, the reasons why, I, I don't think the uh, plan um, is ideal. There's areas for improvement. Um, I think it would be a good opportunity for people in the community to express their views about that and people that sort of aren't writing at the moment as well to be able to express their views about what, what their needs and um, desires are. And also for members of the public that don't ride and don't really care about riding, um, I put a post up on um, a Facebook group page on the weekend about this item. Um, and I was a little bit surprised by the negative response from some of the people that replied to the post in that basically they were saying bike infrastructure is a waste of money, um, a quote saying it was a vanity project uh, of council. So there are people that don't like cycling and that's fine. And so I think consultation gives them a voice as well um, and can potentially reduce criticism. Look, in terms of moving forward, obviously, you know, um, we're at that point where you have to get something in by a certain time. So you're not gonna hold up the process for consultation. I know that um, the City of Stirling, for example, have uh, in their motion, they will be uh, conducting community engagement of their community as, uh, immediately is the quote I think they have in their motion. So maybe there's the opportunity for the council to um, to actually carry out that consultation now, even though it should have happened, in my opinion, a couple of years ago. Um, because I think it's important to get the plan right now because my experience both with, within and outside of government, if you don't get the, you know, once a plan is done, it's very hard to change it rather than get in early on. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You've raised some good questions there about uh, community engagement and we will ask that when we come to the item and thank you for your feedback on the, um, on the Snap, Send and Solve app. That's great to hear. Okay, thank you very much, members um, of the Public Gallery this evening. Okay, so um, I will now go to the CEO for declarations of interest. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, sorry, 
we've received some questions from the public submitted oh, sorry, online. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, please go ahead with the submitted right. questions. So we've received a question and comments from Dudley Maher of Highgate. His first relates to item 6.2, long-term cycle network. The project is a two-year project commencing in July 2018 and ending this month. The Department of Transport claimed that they commenced engagement with local governments at least 18 months ago in 2018. I'd like to contrast Vincent's approach with what was done at the town of Cottesloe. In Cottesloe, a draft cycle network was developed in August 2019 based on community consultation about possible routes. The town's active transfer working group, advisory group, then endorsed the plan. In September 2019, the council endorsed the draft plan and submitted it to the Department of Transport for consideration. The Department of Transport then considered it and gave support for the draft plan. In March 2020, the council endorsed a community engagement plan for seeking community input on the draft plan. In April 2020, the council considered and endorsed the plan, a plan that had input from the community and that had been reviewed by the community. Contrast this with Vincent, where the plan has had no community visibility until last week, has previously been used by the administration to justify the car street proposal, which was ultimately rejected and that has been presented to council with about two weeks to go in the project. To add injury to the insult, the reporter says that the plan includes a secondary path right through Hyde Park, which the administration rightly doesn't support, but they haven't done anything effective to address it. this, like bringing it to council in a timely manner or consult the community. Uh, there's a question in respect to item 8.3, elected member development policy. I put in a submission suggesting that each attendee should be forced to submit an individual report on the conference rather than just relying on a composite report. I gave a real world example where two council members and a staff member attended a conference and the report was written by the staff member without any input from the council members. These policies aren't just for the current council who I believe would do the right thing, but for future councils, the onus should be on all attendees to provide feedback. There's a question in respect to item 5.4, built form policy and design guidelines. The design guidelines are seven and 12 pages long. They are long winded and have gone past their use by date given that the built form policy has been introduced to address commercial as well as residential development in the areas. I think they just add complexity to the planning suite of policies and retention is almost an admission that the built form policy is not sufficient. I believe that council members should read the guidelines in their entirety before the next meeting and decide if they think they actually add anything or just a, uh, a waste of time. I think they should be deleted. There's a question in respect to item 8.1, delegations. At the 30th of March meeting, I asked why the changes to the delegations to plan planning related matters were not time restricted. The response was that was vague and it said that the delegations would be reviewed in six months, approximately in September, and then that delegations would be reviewed before July. Does the administration still commit to the review of delegations after the six months expires in September? There's no, no further questions were submitted. Thank you, Manager. Are there any other submitters um, for questions? Other than Mr. Meyer? Uh, through you, Michael Cole, sorry, no further questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll now go to the CEO for declarations of interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the first declaration of interest I've received is from Councillor Toppleberg, a declaration of interest affecting financial proximity. Uh, in relation to item 5.4, the extent of the interest in this matter is that Councillor Toppleberg's family own a property at 346 to 352 William Street within the area subject to the William Street guidelines. Councillor Toppleberg has requested council grant approval to participate in the debate. Thank you. I've got another one, did you? And there another one from Councillor Castle, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the second declaration of interest is affecting financial and proximity from Councillor Castle is in relation to the petition from the Friends of Anzac Cottage, uh, the extent of the interest being that the Friends of Anzac Cottage are an ongoing client of Councillor Castle's business and Councillor Castle's not seeking approval to participate in the debate or to remain in the chambers or vote on the matter. 
So just in terms of how we're going to manage that with Councillor Castle attending um, remotely, is it sufficient for Councillor Castle to turn off her camera and microphone at that time? Yes? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I believe that's sufficient and she can be placed on hold, which won't remove her from the meeting. Okay, thank you. Apologies, that also covers Councillor Toppleberg. We'll just, you're here, so we'll treat you in the uh, um, traditional fashion where you can physically walk out of the room. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further declarations this evening? Oh, sorry, my apologies. Um, we have a request um, from Councillor Toppleberg to approve to participate in the debate. And just to inform council members, um, the two issues that we're dealing with are quite distinct. There's a the built form policy and then there's the guidelines for Perth and William Street. So I think at the council meeting, it would be possible um, with some tweaking of the motion to deal with those two issues separately. So it may um, provide Councillor Toppleberg with the opportunity to participate fully on the built form policy where he does not have an interest and to separate out dealing with the um, policy on William and Perth. Yeah, so for this, for this week, we're seeking um, approval to participate in the debate. So we'll, we don't need to vote, this isn't a voting meeting, but I think that if you ask questions on the built form policy, that would be um, acceptable. Okay. All right, so what we'll do is we'll go to the items raised by our members of the public gallery, so not to hold you up any further this evening. So that's item 5.2, number 17, Florence Street, West Perth, proposed two group dwellings and alterations and additions to eight existing multiple dwellings. Councillor Toppleberg. Um, thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, so I think my question is to, um, Mr. Naidu, I think. Yes, okay. Um, so the issue relating, or the question relating to the uh, proposed uh, parking bay that's adjacent to unit one and its allocation was asked from the gallery. Can we just get some comments from you in relation to that, please? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, there's a car parking bay um, directly adjacent to the existing unit to the front of the development. Uh, ultimately, there is no uh, separation and uh, privacy is compromised to that existing unit. Uh, there is, as you would see in the officer's uh, report, a detailed assessment on page 81 of the agenda uh, that basically sets out um, the acceptable outcome standard, which is to uh, screen or mitigate that visual um, imposition to that unit. Uh, and ultimately there is no screening. I know that was flagged by the uh, applicant in their presentation, but ultimately that has not been proposed. So what's before us is um, a compromised um, outcome for that, uh, the amenity of unit one. Thank you. Um, and just for clarity, the proposed uh, grass pavers, grass creek, uh, which is, uh, have they been included in the landscaping calculation? Through Mayor Cole, no, they have not been included in the uh, landscaping calculations. Um, and uh, the two visitors' bays that are proposed in the front setback, uh, can you uh, give me an idea of what, if the first visitors' bay was to be deleted, what would be the impact on the development and its compliance? When I say the first, the one closest to the, to the road. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, if that first visitor bay, being the one closest to the street, um, was to be deleted, then ultimately there would be a shortfall in the uh, acceptable outcome uh, of the number of visitor bays being provided on site for that multiple dwelling development. Um, the visitor bays, to clarify, are to uh, serve the multiple dwellings component of this development. So ultimately, if that was to be removed, I'm not sure if you were alluding to the fact that that may create an opportunity to provide 
other opportunities such as landscaping and such. But uh, if we were to, uh, if elected members were of the view to support that removal, you would need to be also comfortable with the fact that there would be uh, reduced um, ability to provide visitor parking on site as well. Okay, and in the event of an approval, a uh, recommendation for approval, the city's, uh, the clause that usually relates to car parking and issue of permits would, uh, there would be an advice note that would indicate, or am I correct, that there'd be an advice note that would indicate that uh, because, the, because the proponent uh, presumed the car parking to be adequate on site at the time of approval, uh, the city would not issue parking permits for the, the site, is that correct? And also, are you aware of the um, properties on site because they are existing multiple dwellings that predate the policy if they do qualify for permits currently? So in the event of an approval, would that negate the existing permits? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I will confirm in the briefing notes about any uh, parking permits that are available to the um, existing residents. Uh, in regards to speculating and, and in the suggestion that this was to be approved by uh, elected members with the shortfall in visitor car parking, then uh, administration's recommendation will be to impose a, or to include an advice note that you um, referred to, which is basically to, to clarify that um, uh, car parking is considered to be satisfactory on site and no uh, additional residential parking permits would be offered. So I'm just, um... Regardless of whether, so regardless of whether there, there was a shortfall or not, so if that bay was to remain, the city, uh, to best of my knowledge, has not approved multiple dwellings with the provision of parking permits for since the city's car parking policy came into effect in 2010. Is that correct? That a standard condition would state that the, uh, the occupants of the property aren't entitled to, uh, to car parking permits? Through you, Mayor Cole, that is correct and consistent with our um, parking permits policy. Um, can I ask that we uh, please prepare um, a, an alternative for approval for next week? And I'm happy to discuss with you offline um, some of the, uh, if there's any specific conditions, but uh, if you can please prepare an alternative for next week, that would be appreciated. Do you make all that can be arranged? Uh, but something critical to that will be the city's stance on the transfer or existing permits, I assume, given the nature of uh, any changes, if it was to be approved, the occupants would have to move for a period of time. I'm not sure if, there's, if it's rented or owned, I'm assuming it's rented, but uh, the status of the permits would need to be clarified as part of the approval. That would be critical for me um, as to whether those permits that exist for those properties would carry through to uh, new occupants. Councillors? Councillor Hallett. Um, thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, just along those lines of if the development was approved, um, could you just outline what the implication would be for, um, in the future, we decided to um, expand the right of way, given one of the issues raised um, in your report is in relation to the, the lack of a setback to the right of way? Through Mayor Cole, could you please uh, clarify that in terms of the right of way reference? So, uh, are we talking about the internal driveway? Just in the report, it was in relation to um, widening of the right of way um, required a particular amount of setback from the right of way and so just wondering what what that means if we approved it and um, that wasn't available to us through you Mayor Cole, I'm sorry I, I'm not sure if you're referring to the same agenda item this is for 17 Florence Street there is no right of way applicable in terms of the assessment that might be the uh, a, another agenda item it's okay manager we'll come back to that <laughs> Um, any questions on Florence Street? No. Um, any further questions? Okay, I do have a few questions on this item. I'm just wondering whether um, some of what the grounds for refusal um,
I guess my main question is that the grounds for refusal put forward by administrations, is this more really about the constraints around the site or do you feel that there has been a lack of responsiveness in trying to remedy some of the issues raised? And I'm just wondering, for example, where the things like the, um, the location of car bays, it sort of appears looking at the site plan that with those two um, grouped dwellings at the rear that I can't see where on the site those car bays could otherwise be accommodated if they are going to be provided. And I just also wanted to ask about the, um, the walkway that is one point, I think it's, was it one point one or two metres as opposed to 1.5 metres. Is there any sort of site constraints if that was to be conditioned to be 1.5 metres wide? And the applicant has raised um, during public question time today that, um, that clause 2.2 could be dealt with by removing the sliding door. So I'm just wondering that if we included some conditions to deal with some of the issues that administration has raised um, and then sort of potentially just some commentary around whether the fact that this is retrofitting an existing multiple dwelling building built 50 years ago, whether we're ever going to um, achieve um, an approvable development with these sorts of recommendations for refusal if um, the two group dwellings are built at the rear, noting the applicant has um, talked about uh, these issues during public question time. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, a few questions there. Uh, I'll start from the top. Uh, you were referring to um, the challenges with this particular site. Uh, that's accepted that there are constraints with this, with this site. Um, ultimately, it falls back to the assessment against the current policy framework. Um, in proposing additions to the site, uh, the city is required to assess it against the current policy framework. So there is discretion being sought in certain aspects um, and those particular um, items that are ultimately uh, forming part of administration's recommendation for refusal, uh, I suppose relate back to the fact that you are trying to uh, upgrade an existing development, which proves to be challenging. Um, we, that's accepted. So that's something that just needs to be uh, reconciled. Uh, administrations of the view that the development on balance does not go far enough to resolve those, uh, those outstanding issues. Um, the car parking, for example, uh, that is created, the issue of, of car parking is towards the street setback and being very prominent um, from the street um, is really created because you're removing that from the rear to facilitate the group dwelling. So a lot of these issues are created from the fact that you are trying to accommodate two group dwellings. Um, uh, there might be an opportunity to modify the development to the rear, but you would potentially lose the, the dwelling yield as well. So that's a commercial viability um, question for the, for the applicant. Ultimately, administration's just assessing this before the policy framework, and ultimately it's not in a form that stacks up um, in, in administration's view. Um, you also referred to potentially conditioning out some of these items um, in 2.2 and the car bay. Uh, if that sliding door to the dwelling was to be removed, then you would have no um, visual outlook uh, in terms of surveillance to that street frontage for that particular unit. It's accepted that the unit above would have an opening and that surveillance could be provided from that unit. Um, but you would, again, uh, be accepting by virtue of that um, a lesser uh, outcome. So, again, these items could be conditioned to an extent, but there is an implication in terms of the amenity and the functionality of the development. And just in relation to the walkway and the widths that was raised as an issue, could that be conditioned or is there a structural issue with that or a space consideration in widening the walkway? Sorry, yes, Mayor Cole, uh, in, it's the latter. Uh, so ultimately by widening that walkway, um, then you would be narrowing um, the adjacent uh, space used as you know, uh, visitor car parking, as well as the driveway itself, which is admittedly tight in itself. Um, uh, so 
we would need to do a technical assessment to see if the maneuverability still works from vehicles accessing the site. That could be done as part of briefing notes if you, if you wish. Well, look, I guess if um, Councillor Toppelberg has requested an alternate, these are the sorts of things that could be looked at um, with any conditions that are brought forward and whether that actually is achievable or some significant redesign. Um, just, you know, just generally though, in terms of what's proposed con compared to what's there, given that the group dwellings are at the rear, I understand the car parking issues, but do you believe that overall it would be a better, um, present better to the street in terms of uh, the street view, the landscaping, um, whether there's sufficient screening of those proposed car bays and the amenity for the residents that are living in the existing multiple dwellings? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, ultimately my view or administration's view is that uh, it wouldn't be an appropriate outcome uh, as considering its current policy framework. The argument could be made um, that it is still an improvement to what is currently existing on site. If that is the test, uh, then uh, that view could be formed. Um, but administration's role is to assess it against the current policy framework and it is not appropriate based on that. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Council members, are there any further questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on. Um, the second item raised um, by a member of the public gallery this evening was 6.2, Department of Transport Long-Term Cycle Network Endorsement. Councillor Hallett. Um, just wondering if you could clarify, and I guess this is through the Mayor to um, Director of Infrastructure and Environment. Um, in the report, it talks about the plan being aspirational, um, but there is also a comment that the future funding is going to be only provided for what is included in it. Um, and then at another part of the report talks about, I guess, some disagreement between admin and Department of Transport around some of the inclusions and that in the future we can um, potentially add different things in there. I'm just wondering what that means for an aspirational document that commits funding to particular things and whether or not we lock ourselves out of funding for future things. And if you can just clarify that. Yes, we might call. I'll do the best I can. And also you'll see that our active transport officer, Sam, is uh, just joined us as well. Sam Jameson, there he is at home. He might be able to help me. You're right, Councillor Haller. It is a high level aspirational document and it's not ours. It's the Department of Transport. I mean, obviously they've liaised with us and there's some areas of, you know, there's broad agreement, but there's some areas of disagreement as well. Uh, I mean, they are telling us that, that the funding, future funding from them, which we've been quite successful in getting, will be based on this plan. So you would take from that that if a route is not, if we, uh, if we like a route and it's not in this plan, then they won't fund it. So, you know, that, that'll be the outcome of that, I think. But um, I mean, Sam will probably add something, but they consider it a live document. Uh, you know, they're happy to review it. They understand that we have a bike plan that's due to review as well. So they expect us to give us, you know, give them feedback on their bike plan. So, you know, the, by no means is the dialogue closed, but at this stage, they are looking for local governments to give uh, those. If I can hand over to Sam, if you want to add anything, Sam, or anything that I've got incorrect there, that's, that would be good. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yeah, so it is a live document and they will be updating their guidelines around bike network plans uh, and it will become a requirement for this document to be reviewed if any bike network plan is updated in the future. Um, so there's definitely an di open dialogue there where changes and amendments can be made in the future through um, bike network plans. Uh, but funding is tied to the routes that are identified in the long-term cycle network. Thanks, Sam. Um, and when you say that they're tied, is that for the duration of that plan? Um, how long is that tied to and when might funding re-emerge for other um, opportunities? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so the grants that the Department of Transport give out through the Western Australian Bicycle Network grant scheme will be 
only the, you'll only be eligible through that grant scheme if the plat if a route is already identified in the long-term cycle network. Um, the long-term cycle network runs alongside Perth and Peel at 3.5 million, which is a document that guides future planning up until 2050. Um, so it will be connected to that. Um, but that's why they see it as a live document because it is quite a future long-term vision. Thank you. Um, and also uh, just could you run through, I guess, what um, consultation um, has happened since it first came out 2017-ish um, in terms of what community versus council um, advisory groups, et cetera? Because um, that was raised by a couple of questioners. Yeah, through you, Michael. Um, today, there's been liaison. Obviously, it's Department of Transport plan. They've approached us, and it's been very much of a technical nature. You'll see the report talks about hierarchy of routes, so it's a very technical response. Uh, we only got the plan very recently, in, you know, in the last couple of weeks. So it's you not know, possible to go out to the public you know, on a wide consultation. But there's nothing stopping us. I heard the comment about the city of Stirling. There's nothing uh, stopping us. You know, seeing the plan, but going to public consultation, remembering, of course, that we will have another chance when we update our bike plan in a couple of years' time. Um, if we were to go to community consultation and we provided feedback along the lines of the things I guess admins already identified that we don't agree with, I mean, what is the point of the consultation if they're not going to change things, or is there still opening to change what's in that document? So you, through you, Michael. So it is their document, so we can feedback and they can take that feedback or ignore it. So I wouldn't say it's a waste of time because they consider it to be a live document, so it'll never be a waste of time. But at the end of the day, we can feedback what we think and they can either take that on board or not, depending on you know, what they think is most important. And they are looking at a very big region. You know, we're part of, you can see how many local governments involved. So they're looking at very high level uh, across the whole region. So, but we can certainly feedback anything even now. Not to labour the point, apologies, um, colleagues. Um, with the, for example, the route for Norfolk to Lake through Hyde Park, which we were not particularly supportive of, um, I guess what's your sense from them around if council doesn't support that, if admin doesn't support that, why would they keep it in there? Through you, Michael, perhaps Sam can join in as well. I, I mean, I think it just because it's in their plan doesn't mean we have to build it. That's the first thing to say. They, they look to us to build those networks. Uh, so it's a, it's a funny way to say it. We don't have to build it, but if we wanted to get funding, it would have to be in the plan, if that makes sense. So nothing stops us building different routes. Um, so, I'm, I mean, Sam, can you give a, um, a more from the cold face view on what the Department of Transport might give us in response if we do raise that again? Yeah, so... I through you, Michael. Um We have raised that with them at the last couple of meetings that we've had with them on the document. Um, there, I, I went back and tried to have a chat with them today. Their, their view is that that route runs from ECU in the north and straight into the heart of the CBD in the south. And when they're looking at this network, they're really trying to see those broader routes that move across cities and are not just within one city. Um, and so from their perspective, that's a really key strategic route to join those two destinations. Um, they understand that our, our feedback about the park. And I think their response was that they just don't think people will, will avoid the park. Um, that the people, even with the route, the primary route on William Street to the east and our local route to the west, I think they still see people using the park as a more direct route. Um, but they did take our feedback on board and their comment in response is usually that it's an aspirational document and it kind of represents the ultimate network. But that's a network that can be and is quite a long time away. Um, and some significant changes will occur before parts of it can be implemented. And that high park is one of those examples. Um, and just in relation to William Street being uh, identified as a primary route, um, is that just a reflection of um, 
high usage of cyclists now or is it anticipated that the state government would want additional infrastructure on that um, on that road? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, for a primary route, if if you look in the hierarchy they outline, it would need um, additional infrastructure. A primary route has to be segregated from traffic, um, and that's based on the traffic volumes and their um, predicted cycling volumes. Um, as I mentioned before, it's aspirational. I, I don't think, I don't have the data in front of me, but I don't think that William Street has those levels at the moment, but they're assumption is that in the future as a one of the more direct routes into the city it will will have those levels councillor toppleberg thank you mayor cole um so i'll save my comments for next week but in the briefing notes can you include anyone who's a resident of Vincent, an officer at Vincent or otherwise, who describes a bicycle lane through Hyde Park as aspirational now or in the future? I'd appreciate if we could find out where, if we are being asked to endorse the document and being told it's aspirational, uh, that effectively means that someone must have an aspiration for it. So I'd like to see who it is that we have spoken to or who it is internally or externally that believes that it's an aspiration to have a bicycle lane going through Hyde Park now or in the future. Uh, and I will flag an amendment to not endorse the plan until the route removes uh, access through Hyde Park uh, as a primary or secondary route. Uh, it's our job to work out how to assist people in avoiding the park uh, if it, it connects to another route. And we've done so successfully uh, with the current route from Lake Street and the use, the casual use of Norfolk Street. Uh, but the endorsement of it on a plan, aspirational or otherwise, is a far different request. And I would like to see uh, an alternative that does not endorse it without the removal of the access through Hyde Park. And there's a million other ways that that route can be serviced most easily. Is this a question, Councillor Toppleberg? It's a request for an amendment. Okay. That's, I was told last week we had to flag them during the Go briefing right session. Go right ahead, Thank I'm you. very happy. Uh, so those routes are available for connection either uh, via Walcott Street, uh, potentially via Monmouth Street, um, or if the idea is to connect ECU to the CBD, there are other ways to get into that direct route, which is William Street, um, which actually connects to the centre of the CBD quite well, or through uh, the existing Bulwer Street lanes can uh, flick back onto, um, uh, back onto Lake Street. So it's not cutting the network, it is just identifying something that is non-aspirational in my humble opinion. Yeah, through you, Michael, we, we can certainly prepare an amendment and we can do some more work on alternatives that we could go to the Department of Transport with those, with those alternatives as we see them. The other thing I'll say, I think the first part of that, Councillor Topic, was a question. I think the people who find it aspirational are the Department of Transport. So that's probably the answer to that question. It's their aspiration. And you can see that, you know, the administration and Department of Transport are not completely aligned on that federal aspiration. Sorry, we just... My understanding is that an officer recommendation for endorsing that aspiration effectively says we find it an aspiration as well. So I'm just, I'm, I, I understand the comments that are in there and I understand that their view, but uh, this, this document will be referred to for the next 20 years and this and council, yes. have, yeah, this council having endorsed it, yeah. if that's the case, we'll Is there any there. questions coming? We, yeah, through you, Michael, we, we, yeah, we can move that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to get some clarity. I mean, there's been a um, discussion of um, that route and its links through to ECU. Um, can I please get a confirmation that ECU, um, as part of the uh, discussions on the Perth City deal, will not be relocating to the city? I hadn't actually been able to see that that had actually been absolutely knocked on um, knocked on the head. So that um, that's one thing that I find quite curious that we've got a, doc a document here that's uh, providing a, a link through to a university that um, does have some likelihood. Currently, we, it's, we're just getting some insider knowledge from Councillor Hallett from the university sector that that's... It's not the proposal for the whole of ECU. It was only um, a couple of departments. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the campus will, will be in expansion. 
Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hallett. Question answered. Um, I also did um, want to know where the staff actually considered um, on that route, um, considering that um, uh, the proposal is that any alternatives um, will not be funded um, uh, by the state. Um, whether there had been um, any sort of cost, um, particularly with that being, that was really one of the, the prime um, routes that really stuck in my mind as well. What would be the uh, the cost to the city of um, of having to make an alternative path, um, whether that's along Vincent Street and then down William Street as one example? Through you, Michael, we can, um, we can see what information we can put together in the briefing note to answer that question. So we could... Uh, um, I would suggest we look at alternatives and we could probably put some broad costs down on what alternatives might cost. Councillors, Councillor Gondoszewski. Thank you. Just a question in relation to the cycle route that's going around Forest Park. Is there a reason that this route proposed goes sort of more through the body of the park rather than around the perimeter, more in line with the Curtis or the Smith Street connection? For you, Michael, I'm hoping Sam can ask that, answer that question because I can't. If not, we can take it on notice. Through you, Michael, yeah, I would have to take that question on notice to be able to investigate it a bit more. I think what I'd be really grateful for, given the lack of engagement with Council to date and the lack of community consultation, is for each and every route in the document a comment to say what input administration has had and engagement and commentary that administration has had with um, transport on each particular route and whether um, as an individual route whether the city has any technical input or um, perspective on the appropriateness of that route because at this point in time I don't feel as though um, I'm quite equipped to um, endorse the document either so I'm looking forward to seeing the amendment that's being prepared for next week. Yeah. So through you, Michael, I might be able to answer that question. I think we are, as an administration, from a technical perspective, we're comfortable with the routes listed in the plan, other than the Hyde Park route, you know, where we've given that feedback. Um, so I think that's where we are. Is that correct, Sam, if you want to add anything? Through you, Michael, yeah, that, that's correct. And just to confirm that there isn't an ad any additional routes, that administration think should be in there at this point in time on the basis of discussions around the ITP slash S or whatever it's called, um, going to be the integrated transport document that's being developed um, so that we're not precluding ourselves from funding that we think we should be able to have access to. So, Michael, I'll take that on notice, if that's okay. Councillor Castle has a question. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm happy for these to be taken on notice. They're really follow-ups to the questions that have already been asked. Um, the first is, could we have some indication of what the practical implications of not endorsing this plan would be at this time, given that it is going to 33 local governments? If we decline to endorse, does that actually uh, make any difference either to the how the plan um, proceeds or and or our... Um, ability to attract funding. Um, and secondly, uh, following on from Councillor Howlett's um, questions, I, I'm trying to get my head around the concept of funding being locked to the routes that have been identified, but the ability for us to go to consultation and suggest um, changes to a live document. So again, happy for this to be in the notes that um, some discussion around how that might actually work if we were to take this endorsed or otherwise out to our community have feedback for the department of transport could that result in a change to those routes which would then allow us to seek funding for those new routes um, or is that really not the types of changes that would happen from um, in a live document yeah, so through you, Michael. So the, the implication not endorsing, we can get uh, feedback directly from the Department of Transport, their view on that and how it affects funding. I mean, you're right, it is a live document. Um, so we could go to consultation, we could uh, go back with that feedback and suggest routes, and they could change the document. I think our feeling is, though, this is a, uh, I mean, what, what Sam said is true, it's a, it's a wide document across a big region. So I'm not sure how successful we'd be at changing their mind. It is there. 
it is their aspirational vision, but we can certainly give that feedback. Okay, I'm going back to Councillor Toppleberg. Oh, sorry, we'll go to Dan Loden, Councillor Loden first, who hasn't asked any questions yet. Thank you, man. Um, so I guess uh, the first one was around the, back to this Hyde Park question. It's quite a steep run down from uh, Vincent Street down to the lake. Is that practical from a, a bike path point of view because of the, to actually build a bike path down that, that slope? Through you, Michael. I mean, it can be done. We have got bike paths that are steep. You know, there are mechanisms to um, make that a bit safer, but it can be done. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying it's ideal, but it can be done. And if, if, um, if it was up to administration, where would we put that uh, secondary route that wasn't going through Hyde Park? How would you modify it? As working on the basis that we have to keep those inputs and outputs from the city of Vincent consistent. Michael, I'd have to take that on notice unless Sam's got a specific view based on that experience. Uh, through you, Michael. So last year as part of the uh, most recent round of WA bike network grants, we applied for funding for a feasibility and concept design of a route along Norfolk Street. Um, the, this would um, have gone around the western side of the park. So it would have used a short part of Vincent Street or one of the streets running above to come across and then round to Palmerston Street. Um, so we're due to do this feasibility and concept design in the next financial year, moving on over the next couple of years onto detailed design and construction. So I think that would be the administration's preference is to take that route around the western side of the park and join up with Palmerston. So is there potential for an alternative that says endorses the plan subject to the secondary route being moved in a certain fashion as well? More aligned with what we're seeking? I mean, we, through you, Michael, we could give that feedback. I mean, you, you, I can see that we probably administration and council are aligned in not thinking Hyde Park's the, the best route. And so it does seem logical that we would go back and, and, and make that point quite strongly. So, yeah, we could do that. And we can certainly feed it back to them informally before council and just see what kind of feedback we get. So we could do that again based on, you know, we could refer to the discussions that we had at briefing and, and feed that back. That wouldn't be a problem. And uh, final question, looking at some of the, uh, the local routes, admittedly um, the resolution's not ideal for my old man eyes. Um, there's a couple of places where the the route seems to loop back around on itself just near the top of, um, uh, in the corner of Mount Hawthorne. Um, and there's another one uh, in North Perth. So I was just wondering if those are, if, is that the preferred configuration from the city's point of view? Or I'm just wondering if there was potentially a, uh, a more direct route that we could utilize in those locations where it does seem to zigzag back on itself. Because my observation is that cyclists tend to not like doing that and are less likely to use those routes. Hey, Michael, uh, we'd have to look at the specific routes. So we might want to talk this week, unless Sam, you specifically want to mention anything in relation to those. Okay, well, we'll take that on notice then and, and uh, identify those specific loops. That'd be easier. Um, okay, Councillor Toppleberg. Sorry, just two further questions. Um, if William Street was to have fully protected bike lanes as is suggested by the primary route, given that for the majority of it, Norfolk Street is parallel and at a maximum, I would say 100 lineal metres from William Street. Can we confirm that we need a route down Norfolk Street if William Street is constructed first? Yeah, Michael, I think I need to take that on notice and just think about it. And the last question, can you confirm for me in the briefing notes um, that in Hyde Park, there is a plaque that uh, indicates that somewhere around 1920, whatever the main version of main roads was at the time, had an aspirational view for a road to be run through Hyde Park and that the community, uh, the community, there is a plaque in Hyde Park, I think, I'm asking the question. 
just asking if it can be confirmed that uh, at the time there was an aspiration from the state body to run a road through Hyde Park that was rejected by the sure, community at the time. Sure, but that one can be taken on notice because it's an hour and we've been dealing with two items so far. So you may call out. That's the best question of the night. We'll go out tomorrow with our detectives. Yes. Look forward to seeing the answer, maybe a photo of the park as well. Um, I'm sorry, I am going to ask some further questions before we move on. Could we have some commentary in the report to talk about how this aligns with the Vincent bike plan of 2013? And just following up on Councillor Gontoshevsky's request, could that also include some commentary on how this would um, uh, be informed by the background work undertaken to date on cycling for the um, draft um, integrated transport plan? Um, could we also seek a date from the Department of Transport on when um, our feedback must be received for it to have any impact on this document? Um, and could we see whether that would allow us to run some community consultation, please? Okay, Michael, yes, we can do that. Okay, and just in terms of the feedback or questions received from council members, this evening it appears that there is definitely a flagging of an alternate motion on this so it might be a good idea for council members to email what elements they would like to see in an alternate motion to see if there's any commonalities between council members rather than preparation of multitude because it does seem to be some common themes there okay any i'm calling out final questions okay we're moving on um so we'll go back to the um through you, Mayor Cole. Sorry, I think Councillor Wallace had a question. So oh, my apologies, Councillor Wallace. Thanks, Nicole. Um, just noted in the report, it said the cycle network took some input from the draft integrated transport plan. Um, I was just wondering if we could get some advice on what the status of the ITP is and what aspects of it we use to inform the long-term cycle network. Through you, Michael. Yeah, I can speak to my colleagues about that. That's no problem. Um, and then a couple more quick ones. Uh, the Summer Street extension um, looks like we're proposing a cycle bridge from East Perth to Ascot. I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, and then I just request that there's a map included of the city's current bike infrastructure network. Um, and then I guess I'm just concerned like this plan's being put forward. Um, there seems to be some acknowledgement that it's imperfect. Um, and we can accept that because we'll have an opportunity to revise it at a later date. Um, I think that's probably true of the routes that are internal to Vincent, but I guess it's critically important that we have the connections to neighbouring local governments correct, as we won't have the opportunity really to renegotiate those um, going forward. So if you've got some notes on that for the briefing notes as well, that'd be appreciated. Nicole, yeah, we can do that. Thank you, Councillor Wallace. And also one final request. Is there any ability to improve the resolution of the plan? Because when you actually, um, when you make it bigger to try to read the street names, it's very fuzzy. So if there, any option for a higher res plan would be fantastic. Yeah, so we call them. we'll do some copies and put them in the Councillor's pigeonholes, if that's okay. And then you can all have a copy that's the best resolution. Well, electronics preferable, given that not all council members are sort of access coming in very regularly at the moment, but if that if the only option is paper, then um, then we'll live with that. Or yeah, if it could be emailed, just um, yeah, perhaps we could just look at the resolution and see what the options are. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, we've dealt with two items that were made, raised by members of the public gallery this evening. So we'll now go back to the items um, and deal with them sequentially that haven't already been dealt with. So we're back at 5.2, number 17, Florence Street, West Perth. Oh, sorry, we have already dealt with that one. We're back at 5.1. Um, yep. Okay, sorry, it was 5.1, um, 539 to 554 Beaufort Street, Mount Lawley, proposed mixed use development. This is an amend, proposed amendment to an approved development. Questions on this item? Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
I got a bit tang- tangled around in plans for the current plans and updated plans. And I was trying to f- understand how with the reduced unstructured plantings, they're still able to retain the level of tree canopy and meet the requirements. So I was just hoping you could clarify that for me, please. I hope you don't mind me piggybacking on this on Council Loden because I was struggling with that as well and I was wondering whether it's a difference between landscaping versus canopy because I, I can't see how you can achieve the same canopy with the reduced trees on structure. So I'll go to um, the manager on that one. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it relates to the amount of on structure landscaping. Uh, ultimately, uh, when, the, when the amendment ap uh, application was submitted, uh, it did propose to reduce the amount of on structure landscaping following uh, community consultation that was increased back to be uh, consistent with that that was previously approved. So the total amount being 18.5% um, of on structure landscaping. Uh, so ultimately, it still provides the same amount of opportunity to provide uh, some. Uh, landscaping, uh, whether it be shrubs as well as um, trees. I do note that uh, as part of this proposal, uh, the applicant is proposing to remove uh, three metre uh, deep planters. Um, now, ultimately that is a significant removal, but nonetheless, uh, there's been other opportunities sought on the uh, structure to provide for additional landscaping. So uh, with the removal of those, uh, some landscaping um, areas, but then uh, increasing other opportunities, it's resulting in the same net amount of on structure landscaping. Go ahead, Council Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, when you give the nod, I can't tell if you're nodding to me or to somebody else. It makes perfect sense. I'm not even having eye contact, I'm just vaguely looking <laughs> off in the corner. <laughs> Sorry. No, all good, all good. Um, so there's this a reduction in these deep planting zones and there's landscaping but not canopy. Um, it, so it sounds like there's going to be a reduction in the number of trees as a result of this change. Is that accurate? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so the landscaping plan uh, that was considered as part of the previous application that was approved uh, didn't designate or didn't uh, specify the minimum number of trees to be delivered. Um, that wasn't conditioned as part of that approval. Now, looking at that landscaping plan, though, um, it would uh, provide for um, uh, a certain amount of trees on site. Through this change, uh, it would ultimately still provide for or capable of providing for a similar number of trees. There's been a condition imposed um, in the recommendation that basically says to maximize uh, tree planting in those planter areas. So they provided the uh, same amount of on structure landscaping areas in the planters. So therefore this, the number of trees could also be provided. Um, and that's been uh, a condition recommended by administration. Can I just seek clarification because in the, I've written notes here that says, this is just my notes I've jotted down, that the trees are being reduced from 58 to 34. So I'd have to search back through the report to find where I found that. But I thought there was actually a reduction in trees overall. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there has been a reduction in terms of the number of trees, but that's why administration is recommending a condition be imposed to increase the number of that tree planting because there is available space, there is a, a sufficient planting area to provide for the equivalent number of trees. So uh, that's been recommended by administration. Which, um, which condition number? Uh, let me just check. So in condition 1.2, it's uh, amending 9.1 of the previous approval uh, to maximise the number of on-structure uh, planting by doing a certain number of things. It doesn't actually talk about number of trees though. Correct. That's through you, Mayor That's Cole. Possible, though, uh, could we actually condition the number of trees? That would be available to you, uh, Mayor Cole. Uh, the previous approval did not specify that number. Um, administration's done a count of what was shown on that plan though. 
Um, so that's how we came up with the numbers. Uh, so if we want to secure the specific number of trees to be provided on structure, that can be done. I thought a landscaping plan formed part of the approved plans. And if the trees are presented on a landscaping plan, then they're taken as being part of the development. Through Mayor Cole, yes, it showed the landscaping, but all of the species and exact location are to be uh, confirmed um, through that condition of approval. So it didn't specify the actual number that can be secured through this. Um, could you consider what would be an appropriate number of trees to condition? Apologies, Council Loden. I really, really apologise. That was quite rude of me to step in there. <laughs> just, I, it just, I just needed to clarify that point before it, we moved away from it. Back to you. That's fine. I think you were asking me the questions I was going to ask anyway. Um, I did have one further question uh, around um, the the verge around the property. If there, what capacity would there be for additional tree planting in the verge if there was not sufficient capacity for trees and so forth with the updated uh, design? Through Mayor Cole, just to clarify, uh, are you suggesting, Councillor Loden, that any shortfall in the number of trees compared to the previous approval, um, if that is the case, then to explore the number of trees that can be provided in the verge? Yeah, so I, I guess to, um, the tree canopy play, plays a part of, as part of the condition around tree canopy, but it also serves a purpose around uh, breaking up the bulk and scale of the development. So it might not necessarily be the number of trees that are missing with the update, but that you could, there's the potential for a condition to put additional tree planting in the verge to help mitigate uh, some of those uh, issues around bulk and scale as well. Yes, that can be done through you, Mayor Cole. Anything further, Councillor Loden? No, okay. Other councillors, Councillor Patakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just trying to get a bit of understanding about the reasoning um, behind uh, the, cha the changes. Um, I understand that there are challenges with the creation of a vertical uh, forest. So just want to uh, know whether the applicant had provided some um, technical justification for the decrease in the tree numbers um, and um, any explanation as to the challenges of uh, planting native species in the vertical forest um, situation that we have here and whether that related back to um, the, vi the long term viability um, of particular trees um, rather than, I think, focusing in on numbers of trees. Uh, I just want to get an understanding from the applicant's point of view of why we've, uh, we've got these amendments before us. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yes, on page 12 of the agenda, uh, there is some comments included that were provided from the applicant, um, which form the reasons why uh, the modifications are being sought to the landscaping. Uh, it's probably about midway through that page. So basically it relates to um, main ongoing maintenance, repairs, and the costs associated with those large um, uh, planters. Uh, that's ultimately the, the reasons why the applicants, uh, through the detailed design stage, come back to seek an amendment to modify the on-structure planting um, arrangement. Councillor Fatakis, have you got any further questions? Okay, councillors. I'm just making sure no one on Zoom is asking a question. Um, it's just further to those questions from Councillor Fatakis. I'm just interested that, um, you know, the uh, deep planter boxes were quite an integral part of the design of this building. And I'm just interested to know um, why it wasn't considered um, to be referred back to the DRP. Um, on the, that particularly on that change to the planting design with the sort of large inbuilt curved pots to what sort of now appears to be um, a succession of planter boxes, which are, you know, quite um, straight lines. And um, I, I, I note the um, condition also to join some of those planter boxes together. And I, I think that is a, that's a good thing. Um, but in, just in terms of the DRP's views, I, I probably would have 
thought that was quite valuable given that that was quite a signature of this particular development. Um, and just in terms of whether this technique has not been previously tested when it was put forward by the applicant. Um, they were the, the remaining questions. Yes, Mayor Cole, it's a, a, a judgment call in terms of referring back to the DRP. Um, so uh, ultimately administration was of the view that uh, the amount of landscaping being proposed would ultimately uh, be the same as that previously approved. I accept that it is a different configuration um, and different uh, pot size and that adds to um, part of the built form outcome. Uh, in terms of, uh, so from that perspective, the decision was made not to refer back to the DRP. That doesn't mean that we can't get um, additional comments though, if that would assist in informing its appropriateness. Um, that can be arranged uh, and comments provided to you following on from this briefing. Uh, in regards to testing it, um, that's a really fair point. We can seek some feedback from the applicant. Um, uh, the style of three uh, metered like, uh, planters uh, can be provided. Uh, it just comes down to ultimately the ongoing costs, the maintenance and the decision whether to pursue that or not. So. The applicants made the view that they don't want to pursue that. So I guess what's before us is um, requires our, our view as to whether it is or isn't appropriate. Administration landed on it being appropriate. So uh, yeah, that would be my feedback in terms of testing it, but I can definitely get some feedback from the applicant. Thank you. Look, I personally would welcome some feedback from the DRP chair if that would be possible before next Tuesday just on, on this issue. Um, Council Wallace has a question. Yeah, thanks, Matt Cole. Um, it's just following on for some previous questions about the removal of the concrete pots. Um, the first reason that the applicant listed as to why they were going to be removed um, was because they require removal by crane to undertake repairs, becoming a costly exercise. I was just wondering if the applicant provided an estimate of the cost for crane hire for a day or any estimate of the frequency with which that would be required. Um, and if not, would administration have an estimate of that? and would administration consider that cost reasonable? Through you, Mayor Cole, the applicant did not provide that level of detail. Um, administration can pose the question to the applicant and provide that to you. Um, Thank you. Councillors, any further questions? Councillor Toppelberg? Just in relation to the second justification for the removal of those pots, my understanding from reading it is that engineering compliance would be difficult to achieve if there was a risk associated with weight because of the potential for blockage and retention and how that would be able to be monitored uh, by individual occupants or otherwise my guess is until you start to see cracking or overflowing or significant problems you wouldn't be aware of it so um, if that can be included in the questions but I would assume there's an engineering justification or if we can get confirmation as to whether they would be able to get uh, engineering sign off on a building approval if the original pots were to be retained. So leaving the cost question aside, whether it's physically possible uh, to do that and to have the building certified by an engineer, that would be helpful too. Councillors, any further questions? Oh, our manager, did you wish to respond to that request? Is that achievable? Sorry, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I nodded. Uh, apologies, yes, uh, we, can, we can provide that information to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, if there are no further questions, we'll move on. Um, that takes us to the next item, 5.3, number 50, Barley Street, Mount Morley, proposed single house. Who would like to ask a question? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. So um, the applicants, there's been some correspondence for the applicant and just, I guess, as a question, is the the applicant seems to have interpreted the reason for refusal relating to uh, height, bulk and scale as relating to the definition of loft. Uh, but my understanding from the report is that, um, and also, uh, let me get my reasons in front of me. Uh, if you look at uh, reason three, which refers to building height and design, so the massing materials, detailing and roof form, uh, am I correct that it is Broadly speaking, reason three refers to the design rather than the absolute height or the definition of loft or three storeys, but yet the applicant has sent some correspondence that they 
like a setback aside, but that seems to be rather fixated on the height being related to the definition of what that height, what has caused the height rather than the actual design itself. Am I correct in understanding reason three? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, I'd agree with your take on that. Uh, ultimately, the applicant um, has provided some or contending a number of points around the interpretation um, of including of what a loft is, but uh, you're correct in, in stating that uh, refusal reason number three uh, ultimately relates to the built form outcome and the design. Um, which ultimately does uh, also tie back to the building height proposed and the street setback, um, but it's to do with the building design. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Hallett, we can go back to your original question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and I'll word it slightly differently, perhaps. Um, <laughs> it was just relation to um, being on the right of way and just wondering about whether the the impact on the right of way is I guess aesthetic in terms of the design of the um, development or if there's um, issues with in the future we choose to um, increase the right of way um, width and what that would mean for a development that's on that site. Through Mayor Cole, um, there is some commentary included in the report um, about the acceptability of the uh, developments on right of way setback. Uh, that's on page uh, 154 of your agenda. It's actually the last comment in the, in the body of the report. Uh, ultimately, administrations of the view that it is appropriate. There is a review setback um, to the right of way. However, uh, the right of way itself has already been widened for this portion um, by virtue of the subdivision that took place uh, that ultimately created this lot. Um, so it won't compromise the, um, the delivery of a six metre wide right of way because that's already in place for the portion of this laneway adjacent to this, um, this property. Uh, in terms of uh, the setback as well, um, being 0.1 metres, it's largely consistent with the development across the right of way, um, which is a six storey mixed use development that also fronts onto Beaufort Street. So, and that's a nil setback to the right of way. So it's not inconsistent um, with the setbacks, uh, but ultimately again, how it does present to the right of way, which is uh, a prominent um, view corridor from Beaufort Street needs to be addressed. And that is still a concern for administration. Councillors. Councillor Toppelberg. Apologies, I did have one further question. Um, did the city at any point have any discussion with the applicant in relation to, the, there's nothing I've seen in the report, but in relation to how it addresses the um, significant heritage list property across the road, which is adjacent to the car park? Is there any discussion? I know we have a heritage and adjacent property um, policy, but this is not adjacent, it's like across the road. But has there been any consideration of how it reflects or addresses or impacts the streetscape in relation to that property across the road? Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, ultimately, that's a con broader consideration in terms of the streetscape. So yes, it is a relevant consideration um, and how it does respect that heritage property. But again, uh, when you're seeking or when an applicant seeks uh, departure, particularly to height and also street setback, the applicable design principles tie back to enhancing the character of the area and having regard for and respecting the, the streetscape. So that forms an important part of the streetscape um, uh, directly across from, from this property. So uh, that ties into the broader issue of uh, the built form outcome and how it is not compatible with the streetscape setting. Councillors. Um, just for the public record, because we have all received a um, a submission from Mr. DeVore Nicolick, the ap applicant who um, wanted to um, provide his feedback this way through email rather than coming into the council briefing or meeting. And it does seem that um, there's, um, that Mr. Um, Nicolick is talking about the fact that he believes the only discretion he's been, that's being sought is around outdoor living area, but um, just manager to go through some of the issues that you have sent an email to address um, this to 
back to council members. I'm just wanting to ask whether that could please be provided to Mr. Nicolick and I'm just also for the record in terms of responding to um, what has been put forward by the applicant. Your summary is that it's not that the discretion is being sought in relation to the street setback, the building height, the outdoor living area, the landscaping and developments on rights of way. And then there's additional feedback around the bulk and scale and the, um, the building design in terms of the massing materials detailing and the um, quite complex roof form. So it just seems that uh, that there's not, that the communication perhaps is not, um, that the applicant does not um, see where administration is coming from and has, I just wondered if there's been attempts to meet and to go through it in detail. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's been our uh, approach uh, to try to resolve the outstanding issues. Um, the departures that you listed ultimately all relate back to fundamental site planning and also built form design. So those are all uh, design elements that can be worked through. Um, we've also, you would have seen in the report that there's a, uh, a section on how this has progressed through the, um, the design review panel uh, chair as well and that concerns which are largely the same um, uh, that administration has um, provided to provided to the applicant now um, prior to finalizing this report um, uh, administration has uh, really been seeking to continue to work with the applicant but they want a view formed on the proposal um, before you as you can see in the uh, correspondence sent from the applicant to yourselves um, though it uh, does contest the number of departures or where the discretion is being sought in terms of design elements. That aside, they are still of the view that this is an appropriate built form outcome. Um, and that's outlined in that correspondence to you. So fundamentally, there's just a differing view as to what is or isn't appropriate um, in this location. Thank you, noted. And I think it was this application that requested that this be brought forward and that there didn't wish to be any further engagement with the design review panel. That's correct? Through Mayor Cole, that's correct. That, okay. uh, that comment is in the report in the DRP section. Okay, thank you very much. Any further comments or, sorry, questions, Councillor Toppelberg? Sorry, just referring back to the heritage and adjacent properties policy, which I know has not been, I'm not, I understand it hasn't been assessed against it, but um, just having a quick look at it, there is no definition of adjacent uh, properties within that. Um, I'd be interested to know what the city's view of adjacent is in terms of uh, adjacent properties whether it only refers to side by side. Um, I'll be happy to receive that in the briefing notes. Do you make a call? Yes, I'll provide that in the briefing notes. Okay, let's move on to item 5.4, outcomes of advertising amendment number two to local planning policy number 7.1.1 built form and Appendix Number 16, Design Guidelines for Perth, and Appendix Number 18, Design Guidelines for William Street. So in taking questions with this item, if we can just deal with um, the built form policy in the first instance, that would be good. And then we can deal with the guidelines separately once we've sort of dealt with those questions and Councillor Toppelberg can leave the chamber. So are there any questions in relation to the built form policy? Sorry. You have questions? I do. Um, uh, it's a request actually. Uh, in a number of places within the policy, it refers to uh, other policies, in particular the R codes, um, and, different, uh, and just if it's possible that where those are made, so whether it's referring to tables, heights, or definition setbacks or otherwise, that those are actually provided as links so that anyone who is consulting the built form policy if they finally find the answer to their question and it happens to be in another document, they don't have to begin searching, it can link them straight to that. Is that possible to, to do and then to maintain updated within the policy? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's um, absolutely possible. We will look to do that on the version of the policy that is published on the city's website um, and we can maintain those links in the document.
Any other questions on the built form policy? This may seem a superficial question, but in terms of just usability and formatting, I'm just wondering whether it might actually be, you know, because it is our ultimate local planning policy, whether it might be useful to consider some graphic design just in terms of the presentation. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, yeah, I tend to agree with you um, and we'll look at doing that once Council has adopted the content, um, similar to how we do with a lot of our other, um, our other documents where we adopt a, a Word version of the content and then we're able to um, design it graphically to look a lot nicer and be a lot more user friendly. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, any other questions around the built form policy? Okay, um, we'll then deal with the design guidelines. So, Councillor Toppelberg, um, are you happy to vacate? Sorry, I had requested permission to sit in for the debate. I'm happy to sit in for the debate for both. Well, we can't vote on that. That's true, and because it's not a voting forum, it's up to me as my declaration, and I'm happy to remain no, in the right, chamber. You sit there then, that's fine. Um, is that okay from a governance perspective? Through you, Mayor Cole, I believe so. Just next week, we'll need to vote on it and then make a decision. Okay, thank you. All right, um, design guidelines. Any questions? There has been some commentary around length and I know that that has been dealt with um, because this, of this feedback was provided during consultation, but um, manager, would you like to just address the concern around um, the, the length of the guideline documents and whether they are um, necessarily um, over, overly long, given that we now have the built form policy. Yeah, thank you. Um, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yes, we received that um, comment that was raised in the public question time, um, also as part of a submission on the guidelines. And um, I do tend to agree that the documents are quite lengthy, um, where a lot of the provisions are now contained in the built form policy. Um, there are st some provisions um, in both of the guidelines that I believe are still relevant that look specifically at um, the objectives of those areas in, in more detail than what the built form policy does. Um, so there, I wouldn't at this stage recommend that those two guideline documents get rescinded. Um, rather, I guess that the administration um, is looking to review all of its policy framework and we've earmarked these two guidelines as well as all of the other guidelines to be um, reviewed in the 2021-22 financial year. Um, and so we'll look at doing a thorough and complete assessment of, of every provision and every objective within the policy and then, um, you know, making recommendations in relation to whether to retain that document in its current format or in a, in a revised format then. Thank you. Any further questions on this item? Okay. Oh, sorry, Ashley. Uh, Councillor Wallace, over to you. Thanks, Michael. Um Sorry to bring it back up again, um, but uh, seeing as we may or may not be passing a long-term cycle network plan next week, um, which designates William Street as a primary route, I was just wondering if that had any consequences for the, um, the guidelines for William Street in terms of streetscape or anything else? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I don't believe that it would have any impact, but I will take that on notice and just check. Um, in terms of the actual streetscape itself, the guidelines um, you know, don't really impact on the public realm so much. It's more, they more provide guidance on development on privately owned land. So um, for that reason, I think we'd still be looking for a similar um, style of design on the private realm, but I will um, just take that question on notice and, and review um, to, to double check. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. So we're moving on from strategy and development into uh, infrastructure and environment. We have dealt with 6.2 already because we had a public question on that item. And the other item remaining is 6.1, traffic management at the intersection of Walcott Street and Beaufort Street, Mount Lawley. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Hallett. Happy for this to be taken on notice. Um, just a query about, I guess the original intent was that it was a trial and um, it never ended. Um, is that something that would not happen again 
with our new project management um, processes in the city. Yes, we may call. I'll take that on notice if that's okay. Okay, any further questions, Ashley? Sorry, Councillor Wallace. Thanks, Michael. Um, it's just on the traffic surveys that were done, uh, the report only really notes surveys on streets southwest of the intersection. I was just wondering if we did any traffic surveys anywhere else. Um, and it, there was a number of a thousand vehicles mentioned in there somewhere. I was just wondering if that was a particular threshold for classifying streets. Um, and then, yeah, just a, a general comment that it'd be good to have some further attachments, like maybe regarding traffic surveys or kind of provide the basis for the conclusions that you're making in the report. Yeah, so Michael, I'll take that on notice. Thanks, Councillor Wallace. Any other questions? Okay, thanks everyone. We'll go to community and business services. So item 7.1 is the petition from the Friends of Anzac Cottage. Any questions on this item? The Councillor Castle has left the meeting temporarily. No questions on this item. We can invite, invite Councillor Castle back. That was quick. Um, 7.2 is investment report as at 30th of April 2020. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Castle back. Yes, okay, no questions. Uh, item 7.3, authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of April to 30th of April 2020. Any questions? Councillor Hallett. Thank you, happy for these to be um, on notice. Um, just in, IC, in the ICT um, credit expenses, there's two instances of website security subscriptions and just wondering if that's a um, repeat of the same one or two different ones. Um, can I confirm that the Beaufort Street CCTV upgrade for 100 grand was state funded? Um, and there was an entry for Beatty Park Cafe expenses and just wondering what the status of the new cafe proprietor is, um, I guess, given the shutdown. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I can answer the, um, the latter of those questions. So with regards to the cafe, we put the, um, the new lease arrangement on hold um, pending the, um, the, down, the closure of Beatty Park. Um, we're just having a conversation with the potential new lessor of the cafe at the moment and arranging for a start date for, for that lease. Um, might go to the Director of um, Infrastructure. For you may call. I, the, I think the question for me was about the CCTV payment. Yes, was that's and, right. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll take that on notice and just double check that. And um, that's also something that would be worth discussing because we haven't um, alerted the community to that. So we should probably do some communications around that if that project has been completed. Sorry, Michael. Yeah, it has been completed. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, when we did lead of all, we did um, communicate around that. Um, Councillor Hallett. Sorry, just a couple more. Um, also, if I'm for, on notice, um, there's one payment to the city of Perth related to retail promotion contribution, just wondering, um, what that relates to, and I'm assuming it's um, COVID related. Um, and then also for Wilson Security and just wondering what we use them for. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll take those questions on notice and, and resolve them in the briefing notes. Thank you. Um, any further councillors have questions on expenditure? Um, this is purely a curiosity. I couldn't help myself. I just wondered what BOC medical oxygen supplies and CO2 for beverage is <laughs> just couldn't quite get my head around that <laughs> carbonated mineral could, water could be carbonated drinks but i'll find out okay, for you thank you <laughs> thanks non-alcoholic good to hear okay um without there being any further questions on this item we'll go to financial statements as of 30th of april that's item 7.4 any questions Can't see anyone with their hand up. Okay, so we will go to the differential rating strategy item 7.5. Any questions on this item? 
Councillor Castle. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I guess a, a request for some addition to the report for next week. In relation to financial hardship measures, um, we've had some discussions in our workshops around uh, the options that would be available for people who can demonstrate financial hardship on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not sure that that was actually covered in those measures that are outlined there, and I'm just wondering if Firstly, if there's a reason for that, or secondly, if that could be included in the report next week. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll um, respond to that through the briefing notes. Thank you, councillors. Any other questions on the rate setting statement? Um, also, just I did have a discussion with the director today about communications and um, FAQs and the ability to use Imagine Vincent EHQ. So it might be worthwhile if um, administration deems it appropriate just to add a clause, um, uh, sorry, some additional information about um, how we will be consulting on the uh, rate setting statement, given that it's not just going to be a black and white ad in a newspaper, but generally very interested in how our residents and ratepayers and commercial ratepayers feel about the way that we're approaching this, given the complexities that we're facing. Um, yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, I completely agree. I think um, we can probably come back with a bit of a comms plan um, and uh, we certainly want to get rate pay feedback. So this is a community, you know, this is a consultative process and we really value their comments. So we'll make sure that um, people have the opportunity to do that and they know how to do that. That's great. Thank you, Director. Are there any further comments on the rate setting statement? Thank you. Okay. Um, moving to Chief Executive Officer items. First item 8.1, annual review of council delegations and proposed amendments to the execution of documents policy. Councillor Gondoszewski. This is where I ask the question just to um, ensure that I'm completely clear that um, uh, as a result of changing the delegation changes proposed um, that uh, the items in relation to transfer of land that come to council for approval prior to the execution of documents and generally where the um, motion both authorise, you know, approves um, the action and then authorises the execution of the document, um, that it is not um, with the proposed change in delegation going to change those items coming to council, just that there will be the... Um, a delegation for the CEO to author, uh, to execute documents. Through you, Mayor Cole, I can confirm that this proposed amendment doesn't provide authorisation for the CEO to um, approve or enter into any um, transfers of land or other documents. It's just the actual signing of the document. So we would need to go to council first to get approval to transfer land um, or any of um, modified notifications, uh, anything else in that section of the execution of documents policy. And I'm just just being completely clear um, to make sure that I've read everything appropriately that in relation to um, the um, development of on count on public land, that um, there's no, in, there is still the intention that those items will come before council as well. Through you, Mayor Cole, the advertisement of that policy is just closed and administration is currently considering the comments received from the community and then that will be discussed with council and we've made no changes to the delegations that are proposed in respect to um, uh, developments on city owned or managed land at this stage. Thank you, I appreciate that. Councillors, any further questions? Okay. Next item, 8.2, Corporate Business Plan 2018-19 to 2021-22 quarterly update. Any questions? Councillor Hallett. Just in relation to the item, prepare a community engagement charter for implementation through policy. Um, it states that the project's proposed to be considered in conjunction with marketing and communications plan. Just wondering if we can get an update on, I guess, where that is going and um, its relationship to marketing and communications, given that it's not just about that. And sorry, just, if this is 
um, very relevant to this question also, given that those um, two items are separate KPIs, if that could also be factored into the response. Uh, through you, Merkel, that's just um, a note for preliminary discussions on the initiation of both those two projects. Sorry, I don't follow. Uh, through you, Merkel, um, we are in the process of engaging a consultant to uh, help facilitate the preparation of the marketing plan, uh, and we're still in. Um, We've deferred some of the working group meetings uh, since COVID started on the community engagement project, and we're uh, looking to restart those discussions shortly. That's your question. Can I just clarify? Are we still dealing with these two? As per the KPIs? Uh, through MECO, yes, they can still be treated as two separate projects or two separate deliverables. Um, perhaps the report to council could be updated to reflect that because I think that um, that is a bit confusing where it's noted as item 3.4 on page 1043 of the agenda. Gee, it's a long agenda. So just seeking some clarification around the wording there because it um, doesn't represent to, it seems to be suggesting that the um, projects be considered in conjunction together. Um, further questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just in relation to some of the assessments on percentage complete um, and the status of the project, um, uh, where a project is um, due to be in the corporate business plan completed by the end of this financial year. Um, I note, like for as an example, the lease and license framework item is assessed as being 60% complete, but is, is green. And I just wanted to get an, an understanding of where something doesn't, according to the current CBP, have a life into your next financial year, um, whether the, it's intended that the 60% will be complete, like the remaining 40% of the project is still on track to be completed by the end of this financial year. Is that, is that sort of what that means? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the reporting framework and that metric is, uh, we're still just trialling it, so it's for council feedback. Um, it's not, um, it's more indicative rather than um, explicit in terms of the percentage but that percentage complete would normally be a uh, assessment of um, how the project's tracking against quality, time and scope. Um, so it might, uh, may not be 100% if uh, it hasn't been delivered um, yet on quality, time or scope, um, but it, that percentage doesn't indicate which bit of quality, time or scope um, may not uh, yet be complete. But um, specifically the project management framework, the framework document's been complete. I think it's been out for public comment uh, and it's on track to be finalized, uh, but there's still some timing, um, still some time to bring that to fruition. Um, we'd probably say it's 60% because on the timing, it's been a project that's been long in gestation for several years. So um, we are hoping that tracks over the next two to three months. So I'm just looking towards the yeah, director yeah, for that. Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, the property management framework is intended to come back to council in either the next um, cycle or the one after. We're hoping for the next cycle, just depend on whether I need to do a bit more work with community consultation prior to that. Thank you, Executive Director. I, I wasn't actually drawing that one out for specific, um, I guess, focus. It was more just, I, in relation to the, and I'm all for the um, community consultation, I guess what I was, um, what I'm interested in is that um, uh, if we're giving something a symbol to say it's on track and we're currently in June um, and the project is meant to be finished this financial year, I would expect on track to main finalise this financial year. Um, and then if it's not going to be finalised this financial year, I would expect in the um, 
project comments for there to be a, a I guess you know that sort of explanation and then a, and a likelihood of when it's you know planned to come through I think um, some of the other ones I had some questions around where the Woodville master plan Leadable Oval master plan Robertson Park master plan the planning framework for town centres the marketing plan the community engagement charter the integrated transport plan and the strategic community plan desktop review um, just wondering if we could um, request just to have a look at those and check that if they are something that was meant to be delivered, a key milestone, it was um, meant to be delivered this financial year, as in the plan was meant to be done this financial year and then the subsequent years really were for implementation, um, if we could potentially check the um, status rating for those. Um, I also had a question in relation to the item about the iconic public artwork. We note that um, the procurement was declined uh, earlier this year, but it has been requested that it come back in August with an updated EOI. Um, and so I just think that perhaps that would be beneficial to include in the comments um, to ensure that that's captured um, both in um, uh, this document, but also in, um, I guess, future discussions about the next CBP. Um, and hold on, did I have anything else? Oh, and just also, just confirmation, in relation to the question on the community engagement charter, um, which was, I believe, a this year project, um, can you confirm um, that it, it's intended to, um, when it is intended for that, project to recommence? Uh, through you, Merkel, we're um, very keen to get that project uh, recommenced as soon as possible, so within the next month. Okay, that's good to hear. Councillors, Councillor, well, just before I go back to Councillor Hallett, let's see if there's anyone else that has asked a question on this yet. Go ahead. Oh, just a follow up. Um, in relation to the iconic public artwork, just on page 1043, um, so the actual report bit, not the um, table of the CBP, um, it says declined and funding reallocated to the COVID-19 art relief project. Is that then not the case? If we're still going through the process, but later. Uh, through you, Michael, I might just ask the director to update um, council on the COVID relief uh, artwork and uh, I think there was some discussions on whether or not an entry piece could be incorporated into that working group. Yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we're intending to bring back to the next meeting cycle a proposal that a significant artwork entry statement artwork can be facilitated through the COVID arts funding process. And the money that was set aside for that has actually been integrated into that process. So that we're effectively uh, using this to achieve a couple of different objectives at the same time. Um, we'll probably have more information on an expression of interest on that within the next week or so. I think that will really help close that procedural loop. Yeah. Um, councillors, uh, look, just to follow on from Councillor Gondoshevsky's query on some of the status of um, CBP items, um, this may be some overlap, but I've noted down some that I thought that potentially should be marked as an orange status. Um, art strategy, Woodville Reserve Master Plan, Britannia Reserve Master Plan. Um, I'm not sure of the status of the economic development strategy, that if that's sort of imminently coming forward again, but I had thought that that was potentially an orange. Again, I'm not quite sure, but implementation of public open space, um, there may have been minor implementations, but I think it's probably in terms of what had been anticipated, not to the same level. And part of that is budget constraints and COVID-19. Um, I think Councillor Gondoshevsky raised the planning framework for our town centres, including Claysbrook. And I also was querying the water um, um, WSUD plan, water, water um, sens sensitive design, urban design. So um, I, when I read this, I did think that the status report, given that the CBP and the items in there were for the 12 month period, I thought that there were some that were actually um, orange rather than green that hadn't been accounted for. So we'll throw you some feedback on those items. Any further questions, councillors? Okay, 
we shall move on to the next item, which is 8.3, Outcomes of Advertising and Adoption of New Policies, Elected Members, Continuing Professional Development Policy, Council Proceedings, Recording and Web Streaming Policy and Risk Management Policy. Any questions? Um, just there has been a question received through public question time and also through feedback about requiring um, council members to um, at who attend um, conferences to all submit a report. Um, I don't have a problem with that suggestion, but perhaps it could either be um, considered uh, if, account if administration could provide some feedback on whether that or a a co-sponsored report so that everybody who attends a conference has some role in participating in providing a report back to council. It's not really been an issue for us because I think other than councillor Hallett self-funding to go to a recent um, uh, conference and providing a report, we have had very little council member attendance, but um, perhaps for future councils, it might not be, um, it might be useful to include. Through you, Mayor Cole, so the current wording talks about a composite report, but we can change that to a composite co-signed report so it's clear that all elected members that attended had involvement in the writing of that report. That sounds perfect. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Okay. Um, item 8.4, appointment of a CEO performance review consultant. Any questions on this item? No. 8.5, Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group Administrative Amendment to Council Decision. I think this was just that the term of appointment was 12 months less than intended. Was that, yeah, a typo effectively. And any questions on this? No, okay. Um, 8.6, Information Bulletin. Go ahead, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, just to request that either via yourself or from the CEO of um, Tamala Park Regional Council that we can get uh, an update in light of the government incentives for um, building both state and federal. Uh, if we can get an update on some of the marketing activities and projected uh, potential upside that we would see for our 112th investment, that would be great. There has been some contact with Tony Arias of, uh, to TPRC during the week and I did raise with the CEO that we have a meeting coming up next Thursday and it would be useful to have a report to the council. Um, and he did respond with some brief information. So do you have it available? I'll have a quick look if I can bring it up too. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, we did, uh, the Mayor did ask me to uh, speak to, to Marla Park about an update on the both the federal and state government stimulus packages uh, and the Catalina sales office and the builders display centre had the busiest weekend uh, we've had for several months with genuine interest from purchases. Uh, the Catalina estate had net sales for uh, five net sales for the week, which is a very good result compared to what we've been experiencing over the previous 12 months. Uh, and uh, we'll provide a further update and provide that detail in the briefing notes. So yes, I'm hoping for a more fulsome report and um, that will be Thursday week, so not in time for the council meeting next week, but um, I'll flow on any information. Any further questions on the information bulletin, Councillor Hallett? Um, just in the register of reports um, on their progress, it refers to the ITP um, under the car parking strategy implementation one from 2014, um, and that the, the draft ITP will be presented to council 2019-20 financial year. Um, so whether that needs to be updated or whether we are anticipating something in a couple of weeks. I get the director to answer that. But uh, through your Mercom, I just ask the executive director of infrastructure and environment to provide a comment on mm -hmm. the timing of the ITP. Uh, through you, Michael. Um I haven't got an up-to-date time in, so I'll take that on the disc. Any further questions, Councillor Loden? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a question on the development application statistics. We seem to sort of have stabilised in this sort of 90 to 100 
um, applications in place. Is that, um, I guess, where we expect it's going to remain? Is that um, what success looks like for us in terms of um, development applications on, on foot? Through you, Mayor Cole, maybe I'll respond to that question. Uh, it's difficult to tell. Um, ultimately, uh, it has stabilised. We haven't seen a drop off um, in terms of the volume or the workload of development applications. There has still been some interest pre-lodgement as well um, for some significant uh, investment and development in the district. So that's really pleasing to see. So um, uh, to forecast into the future, I'm not sure what the future holds. There's still a lot of uh, changes forthcoming to legislation to support um, the economy and small businesses and such. So um, that aside, uh, the volume uh, has seemingly maintained through, uh, through the state of emergency. Um, so just probably more to be more specific, we seem to get about between 30 and 40 applications a month that come in um, and we process about that number. Uh, so if, um, if we could just determine how many um, applications we had in the pipeline at any one time, what would be our definition of a successful number of applications that the, the city actually has? Do we want it to be at 90? Do we want it to be lower? Um, what's our, I guess, expectation of what, what, what does success look like? Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, good question, difficult question to answer. What does success look like? Um, I suppose it's where you, in terms of development applications, you wouldn't want uh, uh, DAs coming in where you wouldn't feel like you're adding benefit to the process. So I guess a number is one thing, um, as you can see that there's been a streamlining of approvals as well, exemptions as well. So I guess balance between that, um, it's actually the, uh, the developments where, yeah, again, it's significant. Uh, investment in the district um, uh, in order to realize like the built form outcomes that we're trying to seek. So in terms of the numbers, uh, the 30s, 40s that you referred to ultimately from historically is the number that looks like success for the city. Um, and in terms of uh, maintaining uh, that sort of built form outcome that we're trying to seek. So I'd suggest that that, that number of the 30, 40s uh, is about right. Happy Councillor Loden. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on the information bulletin? Okay, um, we don't have any um, motions on which previous notice have been given or representation on committees and public bodies. We rarely do under these items. Um, there is a confidential item listed, but that I believe was an administrative error and that wasn't intended to come forward to this um, meeting cycle, possibly next meeting cycle. Um, so I'd just like to say that that was our first hybrid meeting in the chamber and I think that went that went well and would like to say a big thanks to the staff, particularly to our IT team. Um, I note that uh, Peter Ferguson and, and Shamin have been putting a lot of effort in. So a big thank you for that. And um, we look forward to seeing you back at the chamber. Anyone who's tuning in, you are very welcome to now come back into public question time. We are having in-person meetings. So um, we, we're using the hybrid model for now where we're still accepting questions in writing um, and questions um, in person. So thanks very much. And I'll declare the meeting closed at two minutes past 8 p.m.